Okay, welcome to Evolution and Selection 3, and here we'll be talking about speciation. So now we have a, for example, a starting species, and then it changes over time, and it starts to become a, a different species, or it just evolves into a different, uh, and have different features. Or as it's changing over time and staying the same, and then we have a new species that branches off of it. Uh, but how do we know that they're different species, uh, even though is it just because they're physically different? or And then how, what mechanism caused them to become different species? So that's what we'll be dealing with today. So with speciation, we'll be looking at uh, the mechanisms behind it, things that are geographical, uh, ecological, and behavioral, and how separation on these lines cause uh, different species to form, uh, new species to form. And then we'll be looking at pre-zygotic and post-zygotic isolation mechanisms. So the specific examples of what would cause two uh, species to separate and become, um, or a population to basically separate and slowly become two different species. That is why you fail. Okay, so how do species form? How does species A of a bird and species B of a bird, and they're so similar to each other in terms of their genes, and we can track which one came first, and we can see what environmental factors they're adapting to, but how do we know that they are a different species? So we're, how is it happening? Uh, basically, for speciation to happen, you have to have these little microevolutions that are promoting small changes in a population. For example, here are our finches, Darwin's finches, and as we mapped out the changes of these finches and how they're related to each other, we see that there were specific, uh, there was a common ancestor of the finch that came from South America, and then there was a break which recreated two different species, subspecies, and then from there, this one broke off into two different species, which became these. This one broke off into another species that broke off into another one, and then this one broke again, and again, and again, and we get all of these crazy species um, uh, occurring uh, through this tree, basically. So lots of speciation happening. But then how do we know that enough microevolution, enough changes have occurred, and we actually have a new species? So uh, this process of, of species forming is called speciation. By the way, I'm going to say the word species like a ton of times in this mixie. Species, species, species. Uh, but there are two main forces that can cause speciation. There could be a geographical force, which basically means that you're going to stop them from reproducing with each other or have reproductive isolation. So when they're not having gene flow anymore, we're not having them mix genes with each other, and they're completely separated, then over time they start to become two different species. And we can have a genetic limit. Basically, if there are different numbers of chromosomes and they're not paired properly during mating and you don't get viable offspring, or you do reproduce together but then your offspring cannot reproduce, it becomes a sterile hybrid. Uh, so there's some type of genetic barrier that's stopping uh, populations in the same area that can interact with each other, but they can't reproduce together. So before we get into exactly how a species occurs, let's look about how we categorize them. I remember teaching this to you in year 10, and maybe some of you remember it, and maybe some of you don't. But uh, we have the Linnaeus system, which is basically based on Latin, and it is a genus-species nomenclature, a dual nomenclature system. And remember, we have our kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, and then our genus name, and then our species name. And remember that a species, a genus species combination, those two names are not going to be the same unless we have a subspecies uh, thing coming out. So uh, that is the specific name of the animal and how it is categorized and grouped. So here we have different kingdoms. We have our animalia kingdom, and we're dealing with something that has a backbone. And something that is an animal with a backbone that is a mammal. An animal with a backbone, a mammal that eats meat. Animal backbone uh, and a mammal eats meat and is of the bear family. And then of a specific part of the bear family. And then of course we have our polar bear. Or sorry, grizzly bear. And that's where our grizzly bear is basically grouped into. So uh, a lot of this could be based on morphology. Okay, the physical traits of the of the animal. And Unfortunately, though, that is a huge problem when we look at lots and lots of different subspecies or species that are very, very similar to each other. 
because they could be very similar morphologically. They physically could look almost the same. And so you think that they're related to each other, but actually they might not be. So morphological species might be very confusing. Uh, for example, we have our king snake versus our coral snake, right? They look very similar to each other. You might think that they're closely related, but they are not. They are not closely related at all. It's just that the king snake happened to adapt to have a color pattern similar to the coral snake, but that's not actually um, the same group. Or here we have all these different shells created by different snails. Then they have very similar patterns and colors, and you think might that that's just variations and alleles of the same species, but it's not. Each one of those shells is from a different species. And even though they are the same similar pattern and coloring, they are not the same uh, species. So we have to categorize or group each one of them individually. So we really need a more exact method of classification. And while modern classification doesn't just use morphological traits, we don't just use physical traits. We also look at the DNA. Remember we talked about how we can use DNA to show how closely related species are, right? So the modern grouping and classification of animals doesn't go by the morphological concept, it goes by the biological species concept. And it basically decides if two species are the same species or are different species based on their reproductive criteria and then we can look at how similar they are based on their DNA. So basically this is the rule. If members of the two populations either cannot breed or cannot produce fertile offspring, that means offspring that themselves can also have children, then under normal natural conditions, not because we force them to uh, or we use science to make it happen, okay, just in their natural environment, then they are not of the same species. So for example, if we took species or groups of flies and we isolated them for a very long time, and one group was felled maltose, and another group was felled starch, so they're, they're evolving and growing on different food sources, and then we put them back together, if they reproduce, even though they've been separated for a really long time and grew up under different environmental circumstances, they are still the same species because they ha still have the ability to reproduce. If they cannot reproduce, then we now have species A and we have species B. They are now separated into different species. So if two populations cannot exchange genetic information, uh, uh, the long, uh, then they are no longer connected, sorry. So that means uh, if you cannot exchange information, means you cannot reproduce, or you can reproduce, but then because you produce um, a sterile offspring or offspring that themselves cannot reproduce, so that means that you're, the original recombination doesn't matter, that means you're no longer the same species. So what about asexual species? Well, we can use DNA and genetic markers to try to look at asexual species uh, and things that don't mate necessarily this way, like bacteria and viruses. Most of the prokaryotes we're going to have to, uh, of course, um, look at this way. So for example, one of the ways we can use molecular data to help explain things is we can look at um, the, the DNA of, of creatures uh, and determine the speciation of our archaea, our bacteria, and our eukarya. So uh, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya are all really, really similar in various ways. For example, here archaea and uh, bacteria both do not have a nucleus, but eukarya does. Or the fact that bacteria and archaea uh, do not have membrane-bound organelles, but eukarya does, right? or circular DNA. Bacteria and archaea both have circular DNA and eukarya does not. Okay? However, some ways archaea is very similar to eukarya. Uh, they have a cell wall, okay? Or they have a specific type of cell wall that is only found in eukaryotes and not prokaryotes and is also found in eukarya. They have uh, specific types of amino acids that can be formed uh, uh, during the initiating process. We start with methionine. We always use methionine when we start translation, but bacteria use a formal, formal methionine, which is a difference. Uh, when we do growth with the responding to antibiotics, like we, uh, growth is inhibited in bacteria, but it's not inhibited in eukarya and um, archaea. So that means that 
they have enzymes that are able to deal with these antibiotic inhibitors. Uh, there are ways that it's relatively not, not similar at all. For example, bacteria and eukarya, their lipids have unbranched hydrocarbons where their archaea have branched hydrocarbons, which is different from either one of them. And the idea of um, intron genes. Bacteria never really use introns. In eukaryas, they do use introns. And in archaea, there's some that use introns and some that do not. Or the fact that we are histones covering our DNA. Bacteria do not have histones on their, on their DNA. Eukarya do. In archaea, some places or some species they have histones and some species they do not use histones. So it's weird. We can see that archaea really much is this middle group between bacteria and eukarya. So then we make the conclusions based on these molecular data, looking at their DNA, looking at their, their enzymes, their organelle structures, that basically evolution places eukarya branching off of, from bacteria and then archaea probably branching off from eukarya. So that means archaea, really ancient forms of life, probably branched off or were created after eukarya and bacteria separated. So however, after pointing out that the, the, after their branching point, the transfer of some genetic information still can happen horizontally or horizontal gene transfer through transformation, transduction, and even a viral infection. So what basically what we're talking about is that even though a gene uh, started in the bacteria after the eukaryotes formed, the eukaryotes can still get that same gene if, for example, let's say a virus uh, is made inside of a bacteria and then that virus gets absorbed by the eukarya and maybe the gene that was part of the viral DNA um, also could end up inside of the eukarya and vice versa. Uh, we could have transformation and transduction. With transformation, um, you have bits of DNA that are just floating around in the environment and they could just get absorbed through the cell wall and some or through the membrane and sometimes get incorporated into the host's DNA. So maybe a whole bunch of bacteria die and their plasmids get released into the water around the environment and some archaea cells accidentally pick up these plasmids of DNA and they absorb the DNA and copy it into their own uh, genome. So now even though archaea have separated from bacteria the, the archaea may, might have similar genes to the bacteria. So it's, it's pretty difficult using, we can use some molecular data for separating things like archaea, bacteria, and eukarya, but we're going to have to use, uh, also look at the DNA as well, because of this horizontal gene, gene transfer making it a little bit more complicated. So now let's get back to larger creature speciation. So we all know that variation will, of course, drive more variation. So populations of uh, species, they can be spread across a really, really wide range, and they will have different environmental conditions. And these different environments and conditions um, could cause uh, different uh, phenotypes, cause selection that gives different variations of the species. So greater the difference in the environment, the greater the phenotypic variation would be. So for example, here are two different types of salamanders and they look almost exactly the same there's just some differences in their feet structures and their coloration so since they live in very very similar environments they are going to also physically look very similar to each other even though they might be of a different species so another way that species might be connected to each other over a large range is the creation of a subspecies and subspecies is a variation in the species that's enough that we can easily categorize it uh, into a specific group. So for example, there are five subspecies of rat snake and they're all built on the idea of coloration. So in this whole area, the rat snake species are the same, but then we can break them down into different sections based on the subspecies which comes from their color pattern. So even though they are different colors um, they're in colorations and patterns, they are still the same species. They are subspecies. So it's easy to identify them. 
but subspecies can still interact with each other and can still interbreed. So they are still the same species. Another example of this would be dogs and cats. Dogs and cats um, have many, many different versions of them. You have big dogs and small dogs, dogs with no hair, dogs with different color patterns like Dalmatians or single color pattern like a golden retriever. They can still mate with each other. They can still reproduce and make more dogs or more cats. So that means they are still the same species, but all of their physical differences, we are breaking them down into a subspecies. Okay? Okay, so then taking in that idea of what a subspecies is, look at this type of situation. So we have two subspecies, and the way these subspecies are spread across a geological area, they never actually come in direct contact with each other, so they never directly breed with each other. So if they're never breeding with each other uh, and exchanging genetic information directly, are they still going to be the same species? The answer is... Yes, they can still be the same species because they can be connected through the other subspecies. So imagine this idea, we have subspecies A and we have subspecies E over here. And they don't actually interact with each other when we look at how their, their, um, their habitats overlay. But A and B do some mating and can have mating between them. And B and C can have mating between them. And C and D can have mating between them and the D and E have meeting between them. So it's possible over many generations that genes located here in A can work their way through and end up inside of E. So they are still genetically linked to each other in some form of mating. So they are still subspecies. They're still of the same species, though. They're not divided into different species. So we see this, uh, this type of idea. We call them a ring species, or basically... The ring species are where you have intermediates between two populations that allow their genes to continue to mix. Another really good example of this would be California salamanders. So here, all the way down in the very bottom part of California, we have one species. And up here in Northern California and Oregon and Washington and, all, and Colorado, we have another species. So, or a subspecies, sorry. So they're still the same species of, sa of salamander. They are just different subspecies. So the salamanders here can interact with salamanders here. These salamanders end up mating with ones that are down here. And then these ones here can mate with the ones at the very bottom of California. So they're still connected to each other through all of these different ring species. So ring species, uh, however though, if because remember, separation of one species into two different species, this is a long, slow process. It is possible when you have the ring species set up that we are seeing the final stages of the separation between, between uh, before two species and ultimately separate. So for example, here and here, there's a very, very small overlap connecting this species and this one. And if there would be something to happen, some type of mutation that would stop uh, these subspecies from interacting with each other, or there'd be some type of major change in the environment, then these two would be cut off. They would no longer be connected to each other. And then we would see them start to finally completely separate as two different species uh, as their genes are no longer swapping or interacting with each other. So after enough generations, there might be enough of a genetic change that they are now considered to two different species. Okay, so now I've kind of gone over all the ways that things can still be considered species even when they're um, the same species, even when they're, they're separated in certain ways, uh, we need to go through all of the mechanisms in which speciation can happen. So just to remind you what I'm talking about, speciation, again, is the evolution of a new species, and it's specifically when members of similar populations can either no longer interbreed or they can no longer produce fertile offspring. So they can make offspring, but then those offspring themselves cannot reproduce, all right? So it doesn't matter that the offspring was produced because they all die and then, and then their genes don't live on, okay? So the four different ways we're gonna talk about, we have geographic isolation, which is probably the easiest one to think about. It's just physically separating the two species so that they they don't interact with each other. There's no mixing of genes, okay? So separating two groups uh, and causing them different environmental factors, different environmental conditions. So I want you to imagine, for example, we had these uh, population of insects here, and then there's a change in the environment uh, over thousands of years, and a river forms, 
and these are not flying insects, so they can't cross this river. So these two populations, population A and population B, they're now separated. And on this side of the river, and on this side of the river, there's going to be some different environmental conditions. And so there could be changes over time. And eventually, population A and population B, their genetic, because they're not mixing their genes anymore, uh, and they're going through different adaptations because they're under different environmental conditions, they might become two different species. And then when we stick A and B in the same environment, maybe the river disappears and they all end up in a different area as they're moving through the world. And when they interact with each other, they no longer reproduce or they no longer make fertile offspring. So then they are in fact two different species. So that would be a geographical isolation. It's actually the, one of the more common ones that we, we see when we talk about speciation. Number two, we talk about reproductive isolation. And with reproductive isolation, this basically means that they can physically mate, or they can no longer physically mate, or they produce what is called a sterile offspring, or offspring that then themselves cannot reproduce. Uh, again, reproductive isolation might come uh, without geographic isolation. Uh, sometimes geographic isolation occurs, and then reproductive isolation is the main reason why they are, are now permanently separated into two species. Sometimes mutations can occur, and you get reproductive isolation even though they're in the same area, okay? But an example when we talk about re reproductive isolation is whether or not they're going to make fertile hybrids. So for example here, this is a cross between a horse and a zebra. It is called a zorse. And even though a horse and a zebra can mate and produce a zorse hybrid, uh, zorses are sterile. So if I get one source and I try to mate it with another source, they can't. They cannot reproduce with each other. So, and uh, since they can never make offspring, even though this source is a mixture of genes, eventually when this source dies, uh, that, that uh, evolution, that change that could have created a different species dies with it. So it never really actually creates a different species. So after this... After I talk about two more, there's a nice video talking about ligers, and ligers is another example. That's where we artificially cause uh, the reproduction of tigers and lions. Now, lions and tigers do not normally mate with each other in the wild because of the territorial things and behavioral things, but if they were to mate with each other, they can produce offspring, which would be called a liger. However, ligers are sterile and they cannot produce their own offspring, so Ti li lions and tigers are still considered different species, just like a horse and a zebra are still considered different species. Now, next we have behavioral isolation. And behavioral isolation is very common amongst birds and insects, and it's mostly when the populations behave in different ways during mating. So because their behavior for mating is so different, they never end up uh, mating with each other or reproducing with each other. An example would be similar groups of birds uh, populations of birds, but they use different songs for mating. So population A is very similar to population B, but then their bird songs are very, very different from each other. And so, because bird B doesn't really sing the type of song that bird A is looking for, they never have any mating. Just like bird A sings to bird B, but again, it doesn't really work because it's a different type of song and that, that's not how bird B or group B uh, wants to hear a bird song to initiate mating. So it's some type of behavioral trait that prevents them from being able to, to reproduce with each other. And then the next one is temporal isolation. And temporal isolation is very interesting because they're being separated because they reproduce at different times. So for example here we have the wood frog and the leopard frog. And the wood frog and leopard frog, their mating season and the mating activity peak at different times in the year. Here, halfway between March and April, the wood frogs are doing most of their mating, and here at the uh, middle of April leading into May is when the leopard frogs are mating. So there could be some overlap here. And during that overlap, possibly there could be a hybrid that's created, and maybe that hybrid is sterile. But mostly, because they're reproducing at different times, it's highly unlikely that they're going to be mixing genes with each other, so since they're essentially being reproductively isolated because of time, not because they physically can't mate with each other, it's because the time that they actually do the mating is so different. 
This would also be seen with similar species that have different activities during day and nighttime. Uh, certain mammals that are active at night are not going to be uh, reproducing with mammals that are active during the daytime, regardless of how closely related they might be to each other. If all of your activity happens at night and you're sleeping during the day then, and vice versa, you're not going to be reproducing with each other because your behavior, uh, which is linked to time, is going to be very different. What would an ultimate cat look like? Would it be bigger, better? This is Zimbad, a captive bred super cat. Not a lion or a tiger, but a liger. At 900 pounds, Zimbad is almost 100 times the size of a house cat and twice the weight of a lion or tiger. Dr. Bhagavan Antel has raised Zimbad since he was born. Now, this Bengal tiger is about 500 pounds, a fully mature male. He's got a large head, big bone structure, but it's dwarfed when you see this huge liger boy. His head is almost twice the size of this Bengal tiger's. It's so long from tip to nose here that you've just got an enormous structure. The width in these huge jaw muscles and these big bones just make him be an enormous character. You're a good boy. This liger is the product of bizarre breeding. They do not exist in the wild. A liger is created by breeding a male lion with a female tiger. The result is a hybrid offspring that is abnormally large. In size and weight, a liger simply dwarfs its parents. Its massive skull alone can be 40% larger than a lion's or tiger's. They have enormous thick bone structure and can be actually the size of their mother and father combined. Enormous beasts. Scientists are still trying to understand why hybrids like ligers can become so much larger than their parents. What they do know is that ligers are missing the growth inhibiting gene that keeps them at a normal size. They only live in captivity but the scale of their predatory tools is unmatched, even in nature. Ligers share the same ancestral hardware with other big cats. The only real difference is size. Like lions and tigers, a liger's massive canines are set deep inside the skull, like giant screws. Big cats have enormously long teeth, but a lot of the tooth is actually hidden inside the skull. This much of the tooth you can kind of see is covered in enamel. That's how much of the tooth actually is exposed and is used for the killing bite. The rest of this is inside the skull. Deep inside the skull, it's planted in and held fast so that it's able to take the enormous torque that will be produced by the animal biting down and then pulling back. If it had a smaller structure to it, these teeth would end up breaking off. But this is what holds it into place. So now that you see the mechanisms in which uh, speciation can happen, uh, let's think about the different ways that uh, speciation can cause evolution or changes in a group. So the different types of evolution we have would be, first off, would be a divergent evolution. And a divergent evolution is basically saying that at one point there was a common ancestor. And from that common ancestor, because um, of different environmental conditions, maybe geographically isolated, most likely, uh, we get two different species that shoot out from that common ancestor. And these two independent species, even though they were closely related at one point, uh, they become more and more uh, dissimilar. They become more and more different from each other as they're adapting to their environment. So that's basically, it's, it's two species being branched off from an original one that no longer exists. That's also important to point out the common ancestor uh, no longer exists, it's, it's gone. But these two remaining species, well, now, now the woolly mammoth is extinct. But at one point, the woolly mammoth and the modern elephant probably were existing somewhere near the same area, perhaps. Um, but the common ancestor is gone, and so we get these different species that have branched off from it. Uh, another one we would see is adaptive radiation evolution, where basically you have an ancestral species evolving to many, many, many different species, all in relatively the same area, but because of small changes in the habitat. So an example would be like the finches that we see in the Galapagos Islands, or the finches that we see in Hawaii. So here is Hawaii, 
And here we see this is the possible ancestral bird, the original finch species that came to Hawaii. But then we see on different islands, there are very, very different forms of the same birds in different parts of the same islands. Oh, another one. Uh, so different parts of these islands and different islands, they're going to have uh, different environmental conditions. So from this original ancestor, all of these uh, offspring, all of these uh, different versions of a finch have originated from as they're adapting to their different environments. So it all comes back again to this, this one uh, ancestral uh, start, starting point. The only thing that gets really different than a divergent is that the reason why is because we're getting many, many species all radiating from a common one at the same time. So it's like super, super divergent because lots of species are diverging over and over again from what is going to be a possible ancestral species. Come on, there you go. And the last one would be a covergent evolution. And covergent evolution is really interesting. Uh, it's where we need to be very specific on uh, that evo that, that uh, certain organisms are not related to each other, but the reason why they have similar traits is because they evolve them independently. Uh, so this would be, for example, uh, organisms that are capable of flying. So we know that ancestral birds led to the modern falcon, and some type of ancestral mammal led to the creation of a bat, and some ancestral reptile led to the pterodactyl. Now, they all evolved the same physical traits, light, hollow bones, large wings, these membranes around the wings that allow for flight, uh, clawed feet uh, for landing on things, uh, very aerodynamic bodies to allow them to fly through the air. Their physical structures are very, very similar to each other. However, they are not actually related to each other in terms of evolution. They are all just adapting to have the same traits. They're adapting uh, to the laws of aerodynamics. The laws of aerodynamics, basically what says when something can and cannot fly in Earth's atmosphere, so planes and helicopters and air, paper airplanes, like they're all following the same ideas of lift and drag and, and, and air pushing up under the wings and everything like that. So they're all adapting to the same environmental condition, which is wanting to be able to fly and to control yourself during flight but uh, they're not actually related to each other. They're just uh, dealing with the same environmental condition, and so they've developed similar ways of dealing with it. Okay, so then when we take our speciation mechanisms, our geographic, our temporal, behavioral, reproductive, we then can break them down into the two different types of speciation that actually occur. So the speciation mechanisms, that's how speciation is happening. But then how do we categorize the types of speciation? So first off, we deal with allopatric speciation. And allopatric speciation is mainly only going to occur through the geographic mechanism or geographic isolation. And with allopatric speciation, allopatric basically means different homeland. So we're talking about some type of physical barrier that is going to separate our populations. So this, of course, is going to have to be geographic isolation. That's the mechanism that is driving allopatric speciation. Now, when this happens, basically, you just need to have a physical barrier. So there is no gene flow, right? There's no exchanging of genes between these two groups. All right, no more gene flow. And since there's no more gene flow, they're going to be reproductively isolated. And, and as they mutate over time and become better adapted to their environment, they're going to take on specific traits and possibly evolve into two different species. So for example, the archipelagos are a good, a good example. We have species clusters. So again, like our radial adapted evolution right here, some type of common ancestor. And from there, we get all of these different types of finches and birds that evolved under different um, and environmental conditions. And because they're all on different islands and they're geographically isolated from each other because they didn't jump from one island to another island, um, they didn't have any gene flow between them, and eventually they became different species. Now, how do we test for speciation or have we test if a species has actually become two different species? It's very simple. We just have to do a second contact test. And with second contact, basically you take uh, members from population one, so let's say this population and a member from this population, and we put them together and we see, do they reproduce? Are they reproductively isolated now? 
or if they produce hybrids, do they produce um, uh, fertile hybrids or are they sterile hybrids? If they produce sterile hy or fertile hybrids, if they actually produce hybrids that can reproduce, possibly they are limited to two specific hybrid zones. So for example, this bird might have a territory like this, and this bird has a territory like this. And only in this one section do we see that there is another species that's being created, or not, there's a hybrids that are being created. So it's this idea that they could be separated species, but under, under very specific circumstances, uh, they might be able to produce hybrids. And again, whether or not these hybrids are fertile or unfertile is a, is a big test for whether or not we have allopatric speciation. Now, the other type of speciation is where we're dealing with sympatric speciation. And this would be mostly be driven by behavioral or even temporal uh, isolation. And again, uh, this mechanism, behavioral and temporal, is leading eventually to reproductive isolation. Ultimately, reproductive isolation is, is, the, is the main mechanism that's, that causes species to separate into two groups, to separate into two different species. But there are other mechanisms that can contribute to it. So sympatric basically means it's the same homeland, and it's when populations that are not separated geographically still have some type of driving force that causes a new species to be created. Okay? So here we see our allopatric speciation. We have a piece of land. We get divided by some type of barrier. They are geographically and reproductively are geographically isolated. Then we put them back together and we see that they are, in fact, reproductively isolated. And so uh, they are actually two different species. With our sympatric, we have an area and there's some type of mechanism that causes a new group to form that is behavioral uh, temporal or reproductively isolated and as this group continues to grow and flourish we see a second species growing inside the same area as the first species so they're sharing the same area basically so a good example of this would be insects that live on a particular type of plant so there could be for example this uh, this P. aphid uh, grasshopper and it likes to live on these pea plants and the specific types of pea plants but at some point there's a mutation and this mutation ends up uh, producing another species maybe another group and they only like to eat and live on one particular type of plant so since they only live on one particular type of plant they're now separated from this group and slowly over time they're going to become reproductively isolated as well as they as their genes change and they develop to their environment and now they are separated as the two different species. Then it could happen multiple times. We could have another mutation that separates this group, another mutation that separates this group. And because this group is not going to share the same flower or the same species of flower, they are also reproductively isolated from each other. So you can have a mutation in various groups of mutations, actually, not just a single mutation, but multiple mutations. And these multiple mutations cause a new species to originate from the original because they decide that they're going to eat a different plant and live on a different plant for the rest of their life. So the new population moves to a new host, they're now separated, and this moves them towards the process of speciation. Okay. Um, sometimes this also happens with polyploid plants, uh, and that actually can happen so quickly that we can have speciation happen within a single generation. So that's actually what the rest of this PPT is going to be about. We're going to look at how Polyploidy, or the mixing of the number of chromosomes inside of plants, can cause plants to really quickly change from a species A into species B and cause speciation. So ultimately, it's genes that are the driving force for speciation. Reproductive isolation is the most common mechanism or the most definite mechanism, but really that reproductive isolation is driven by mutations or genetic differences between these two groups. So ultimately the reason why species A is going to be different from species B and they're going to be considered two different species is because genetically they are different enough from each other to be considered two different species, to have the physical limitations reproductive limitation, temporal limitations, behavioral limitations that cause them not to reproduce with each other anymore, so now they are considered two different species. So a lot of different factors in the environment are just 
helping them move along to this uh, to this ultimate separation caused by genetic changes. So here are a couple examples. Then we look at genetic divergence. And genetic divergence basically means that it's genetically they are separated from each other enough and they are now reproductively isolated from each other. So there are enough changes in their DNA that, that have resulted in a change of their behavior or, or anything like that, that they are now reproductively isolated. So example, we could look at uh, uh, plats and, uh, sorry, uh, platies and sword tails. Uh, so basically, uh, this is one group and this is another group here. And this is one group. And uh, they, this is a sword tail, obviously, and this is a platy. And they can produce hybrids, except that their hybrids have a mutation that causes lethal tumors <laughs> to spread all over their bodies. And so they die relatively quickly. So uh, because they produce, uh, because their genes, by mixing their genes together, they produce basically just a whole bunch of cancer inside of the offspring. And so they die. Um, the genet there's a genetic reason for their reproductive isolation. Their genes will not allow for a hybrid to survive. Uh, we can look at snail species, for example. Snails, uh, they need to reproduce in very uh, specific ways, and actually the rotation of their shell, some go this way, some will go this way, and if their, their uh, swirl of their shell is in the wrong direction, it can actually ca make it so they physically can't mate with each other anymore because the shell is physically getting in the way. So we have seen this before with different species of snails. A mutation that changes the direction that they produce their shell, so the coiling in the wrong direction actually stops them from being able to physically mate with each other, so now they are reproductively isolated because of the genetic problem because of the mutation. And then there could be a sexual selection in birds, for example. A mutation in their DNA might change the way that they're going to sing songs or the way they're going to dance or do displays. So that means that the males in the population might not be attractive to the females, and so they are uh, reproductively isolated from one group. They could also start to become more attractive to females in another population, so then they like, might shift. They might have a dramatic um, gene flow from one population to another population. So essentially, they become uh, unsuccessful mating pairs in population A, but successful mating pairs in population B, and from there, it's increasing the chance that we're going to see speciation between population A and population B over time. So ultimately, this is just coming back to this idea that genetic, uh, everything is coming uh, with speciation comes down to differences in their genes, genetic variation. Okay, there's just a whole bunch of different ways we can look at the mechanisms that ultimately come back to your DNA, to your genes. Okay, so then now I want to look at a very specific types of mutations or changes in the DNA, uh, specifically your chromosome numbers and how that very quickly can cause speciation. Now, just to, before we get into this, I want to make it clear that this type of mutations that cause speciation like this really only happens in plants because plants can be polyploidy and survive. Most animals cannot be polyploidy and survive. And if you don't remember polyploidy, polyploidy is the idea that you have more copies of your chromosomes than you should. So most of the time with, uh, with mammals, having extra copies of your chromosomes have horrible, horrible results. Typically, they have a negative effect on you entirely. But with plants, it actually has a really positive effect on them. A lot of times having extra chromosomes can make the plant stronger. Uh, and actually, depending on how it gets those extra chromosomes, it can cause speciation. So with polyploidy, and particularly in plants, there can be an extra amount of chromosomes that lead to reproductive isolation because the number of chromosomes in one gamete don't really match up with the number of chromosomes in the other gamete, the male or female gamete. Uh, and so when the gametes come together, they don't produce a viable offspring because the number of chromosomes is just too confusing and it doesn't work, and so the, uh, the offspring dies. So uh, there's different ways that this can happen, and they're both kind of complicated. So I'm going to try to go through this uh, slowly and give you a good example. And if you're still confused, maybe you've got to watch it a few times. Uh, but we'll look at it in class, and hopefully that will help you explain it to you.
so first off, we have the idea of auto polyploidy. And we talk about auto, uh, it's basically, it's driven by yourself, or it's a self mutation. Uh, and uh, polyploidy having too many chromosomes. And basically what happens is during meiosis, uh, the homologous chromosomes, they don't end up separating. And because the homologous chromosomes don't separate, instead of getting haploid cells, you get unreduced gametes or diploid cells as your gametes. And that means you have an entire extra set of chromosomes, more chromosomes than you need. Uh, and we can see this happening as grass and violets and chrysanthemums, which is another type of flower. Uh, these have evolved uh, to different species, mostly because of autopodoploidy situations. So then the unreduced gametes eventually uh, mix uh, uh, to make a tetraploidy offspring. And the tetraploidy offspring means that it is 4n, and that's not good. Uh, and so basically that leaves the plant with only uh, two options. It can either self-pollinate, uh, in which case it starts becoming the first member of a new species, uh, or if there are other tetraploidy plants around, it could mate with the other, mate with the other tetraploidy. So I want you to imagine uh, this situation. So uh, here's your diploid cell, and this is where you're supposed to be doing meiosis. And you know that this is 2n, and it's supposed to go through meiosis and to become n. But unfortunately, this doesn't happen. So you can have different situations. You could have a situation where you end up with triploidy, end up with 3n, or you could be tetraploidy, where you end up with 4n. Okay? So basically what happens is 3n would be an unreduced gamete plus a regular gamete come together, and so that gives us our 3n. 3n is going to be different than 2n, so that means that this plant can no longer reproduce with this plant. Here, of course, would be if we had 2n uh, gametes mixes with another unreduced or 2n gametes, and that gives us 4n. Again, 4n, two matched chromosomes for our 2n, so that means that these two can no longer mate with each other, and these two can no longer mate with each other. Also, these two cannot mate with each other because 3n does not mix with the 4n, right? So ultimately, the only thing that can happen is that the 3n or the 4n are going to have to either reproduce with themselves doing self-pollination, or if they are around another 3n or another 4n plant, then they can reproduce, okay? So here, for example, let's say we're uh, getting unreduced. This is 2n and it was supposed to, uh, and it didn't, um, it didn't get to do the reduction. So here we have 2n. 2n gametes, they do self-pollination, and we end up with 4n. So that means that this plant, this new plant that grows up, can no longer mate with the plant that produced it. It's going to have to do self-pollination to create more members of its own new species, and ultimately, after making enough members, it can uh, mate with other, with other versions of itself. So you're probably thinking, well, doesn't, isn't that really hard uh, genetically? Uh, having so many extra chromosomes and is there enough variation for the species to survive and this is the really interesting about plants is that for other species or other types of organisms we would say no there's a really good chance that the offspring are going to die because they have too much chromosomes and uh, there's not enough variation for the species to really grow from there but with plants they are a very very stable form of life and they can continue on uh, under these circumstances and just create a different species so this 4n plant is now reproductively isolated from everything that is non-polyploidy. So if anything else that is, uh, is not a 4n plant is now something it cannot reproduce with. So actually, if, you, if you're thinking about this, I hope you uh, caught on to this really quickly, but basically within a single generation, you can go from species A to species B. Just a single generation. Species A is supposed to create, supposed to be 2n, and it produces offspring that are 4n, and because it can reproduce with itself and continue on uh, doing self-fertilization and can continue to make more offspring, that, that, and those offspring can also do their own reproduction, essentially we've gone from species A and done speciation to create species B within a single generation, so it's very, very fast. Okay, so then the other way that we can see uh, polyploidy coming into effect and causing speciation would be allopolyploidy. And allopolyploidy 
is again more like other just like we had a uh, different homeland or other homeland and all of Patrick's speciation all of polyploidy means that we're we're using another group's uh, DNA in order to create the new species so basically what happens is that two very closely related species they can't be too separated from each other they should be closely related uh, species well they will form a hybrid uh, and normally this hybrid is going to be sterile however because it is a plant and plants can do self-fertilization the hybrid can reproduce with itself and after forming gametes through meiosis Sometimes it gains the necessary chromosomes that it needs in order to become a new stable species. So I want you to imagine this situation. Look at the math. So we've got species A, which is 2n and 6. And we have species B, who is 2n and 4. So that means when they do uh, meiosis, this should end up with n, which will equal 2. And this will end up with n, which equals 3. So species A does normal meiosis and gets a normal gamete, which is uh, N3. But unfortunately, species B, at some point, there was a mistake, and we have polyploidy happening. And an unreduced gamete, it now has four chromosomes. So we don't have two like we're supposed to. Uh, we end up with N equals four, or two N equals four. So then when these two form a hybrid, there are seven chromosomes. And because there are seven chromosomes, they can't separate appropriately. So being uh, that the, the n is now equal to seven, uh, this can't reproduce with species B, and this can't reproduce with species A anymore. So it's now a separate hybrid. Now, this hybrid could continue to try to reproduce with itself, okay? Um, but it might not be the most stable situation because uh, s seven chromosomes being an odd numbered chromosome isn't necessarily like super uh, stable for plants. Typically we like to see chromosomes appearing in even numbers uh, so that they're evenly divided uh, So when you do uh, meiosis. Basically if you have these seven chromosomes like you can get four and you can get three and when you do meiosis, right? You're not going to get an even number when you do meiosis here because of the odd number of chromosomes okay so uh, it could reproduce with itself uh, but ultimately another thing could happen where an unreduced gamete again with seven chromosomes that might fuse with a normal gamete from species a and that actually gives us two equal or two n equals ten so now we have a viable fertile hybrid that can go on and produce regular do meiosis by itself. Again, it could do uh, n equals five, n equals five. So we can we can divide them evenly now, the ten chromosomes evenly when we do meiosis. So we have a nice strong fertile offspring through this process. So it's a little bit more complicated than the uh, the polyploidy that we saw before, but it's another possibility where we have an unreduced uh, meiosis, an unreduced gamete making an uneven hybrid, and then that hybrid somehow getting the right number of, of uh, chromosomes it needs in order to make a stable hybrid later on. So this doesn't happen with lots of plants, but there are a few that we've seen it happen to, uh, particularly uh, coffee, uh, cotton, potatoes, and tobacco here, uh, have all created new species with different characteristics uh, because of this type of speciation, which was driven by allopolyploidy. And because, again, just like the, the other polyploidy we're talking about, uh, you can create a new species within one generation, you can have very, very fast speciation this way. Now, the last thing I want to talk to you about, it's not in the curriculum, but it's still kind of an interesting thing. Another way that we can have really quick speciation would be formation of reproductive isolation because of a chromosome alteration. Basically, a major change in our chromosomes through a chromosomal mutation. Remember, we had inversions, translocations, deletions, duplications, all of those different chromosomal mutations that we talked about before. Uh, if there's a major chromosome mutation, depending on how uh, the mutation affects the offspring, you could have very quick speciation through this process. So an example of this would be human beings versus uh, gorillas and chimps.
So human beings have 46 chromosomes, and gorillas and chimps have 48 chromosomes. And they believe the reason why we have less chromosomes than them is because there was the loss of chromosome number two, uh, or sorry, the loss of two chromosomes in order to form chromosome number two. So in early versions of chimpanzees and gorillas, or some ancestor that chimpanzees and gorillas came from, but humans diverged from, there were two separate chromosomes. We'll call this chromosome A and chromosome B. And at some point, a section got deleted, and then these areas, the, the telomere at the end, got deleted. And when that telomere got deleted, there was a, basically a fusion of chromosome A and chromosome B, and this uh, is going to become chromosome number two inside of humans. And there you go, boom. Now humans have or the species that eventually becomes humans, uh, has less chromosomes than chimps and gorillas, uh, or the species that, uh, was, that gorillas and chimps are coming from, uh, we are reproductively isolated from them. So now we're, we're distinct uh, reproductive isolation, we're, so we're going to evolve in different directions, and we're not going to be producing any hybrids because of this fate, or because of this, uh, this occurrence. And we look at our DNA, we actually see this inversion at the centromere on number two actually happens. And this is where this divergent point uh, occurred. So if we look at, this is the human being chromosome. Uh, this is the chimpanzee, the two chromosomes that we're looking at. And we see that it probably happened very similar, more to uh, chromosomes with chimpanzees than gorillas. Because you look at the banding pattern. Up until this point here, and up into this point here, the human chromosome number two here, and chromosome, we'll say A and chromosome B from the chimpanzee are the same. Look at the banding pattern, it's almost exactly the same. Now, of course, the exact sequence for the genes on those chromosomes is probably going to be a little different, right? However, the, we can see that there was probably a connection at some point that shows where our number two chromosome came from. So at some point here, this area got deleted, so we removed it, and then these two chromosomes fused together, and that created chromosome number two that we see in, in human beings. So I just thought you guys would find that really interesting, how uh, we can track possibly one of the points of speciation between us and gorillas and chips. Okay, so once again, sorry that this was a relatively long one. Um, I don't think the material is really difficult, it's just there's a lot of vocabulary, so you gotta make sure you learn your words. But conceptually, I don't think it will be that hard for you guys. So uh, do these practice problems, and we'll look at this stuff more in class, and we'll get to this unit so that uh, we'll be almost done. We'll be ready for your mock exam in January. Alright, I'll see you guys in the next class. Thanks for stopping by.